Okay. Uh, 633, I do expect other folks to show up, but let's get started so that we can cover the ground we need to cover. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I want to uh, greet Nick Connor. We wave and just say a quick hello. Hey, everybody. Good to see you all. You can, can you explain what your role is so the folks know? I can sure try. Um, my name is Nick Connor. I'm the community liaison with the Montpelier Roxbury Public School District. It's a new role this year, really doing uh, everything I can to be supportive of students and families, both inside and outside of schools. Um, attendance is certainly a, a piece that I dial in on, but engagement in general, uh, supporting families that, that may not be engaging for a number of reasons, and really helping to navigate some of those barriers they may be facing uh, when it comes to engaging in school. Um, so that means a lot of home visits with families. That means a lot of time on the phone with families, uh, just spending a lot of time out in the community learning and, and working alongside our families in the district. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so because I designed these meetings to be only nine minutes long, we are going to be constantly up against it in terms of time. Uh, on the other hand, we'll all get home to families or um, dinner or whatever else we have on our agenda. Who's just joining us now? Oh, hey, Rhett, how are you? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, it kept trying to make me log in with a different account. I don't know what's going on, sorry. We're, we're glad to have you, we just got here and uh, uh, Nick Connor introduced himself, but um, we are ready to roll. Okay, I am looking for any public comment. That would be any people who are not on the committee. I'm not seeing any virtual hands uh, and I'm not seeing anybody here in the library with me. So we're gonna move on to consent agenda, which would be approving the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, I sent those around shortly after the, that first meeting and then again today. Does anybody have any uh, edits or revisions to those? All right. I don't know if I want to do silent. Silence is is assent, but let's try for thumbs up visually, if you're good with those minutes. All right, fantastic. Uh, look, I'm already out of order. I have welcome Nick Nick Connor on this part of the agenda, but here we are. Um, okay, so I I'm gonna I did it in writing, but I'm gonna do it again in person. I'm sorry that I was late getting you the draft survey. I got it to you guys midday today and my goal was on Friday. Um, part of that is my inclination to keep working on it and I need to stop working on it and trust you all to contribute significantly to it. So here we are. Uh, I know that a few people had a chance to re uh, review the survey draft earlier today and I'm grateful for you giving that, giving that your time. Uh, before we get into revising it and giving feedback. I just want to review that I think it's important to think about the this written survey is only one of several tools we can use to engage with the public. Um, but I feel like it's important to get this one as close to right as we can because it will many of the other things that we do will build off of this. Um, just the same way I introduced the scope of inquiry last time, sort of the areas that I thought we should be investigating as we as we engage with the community. That was partly a structure for me as I would design something like the survey or I think about community engagement, the, the scope of inquiry was a, a tool. And then this survey also is an important tool in the sense that, for example, if we had, if we had left off questions about academics, that would be a glaring absence and it would uh, handicap us as we go forward and try to get a, get good information. So I've allocated a, a bunch of time tonight to go over this survey draft, review it, get get feedback. Um, the results from this survey need to be information that we can use, share, communicate to the board and the public. Uh, for me, at least, uh, one of my goals is that we have high participation. That means a lot of people engaging with this and filling it out. Um, one of the explicit goals of the board and of mine is to include as many underrepresented voices as we possibly can in this survey and in this process broadly. 
uh, and to make the survey and our process accessible by most or all people in our communities. And I mentioned that explicitly because as both Mel and Sigrid mentioned last time, not everyone interacts super well with a written survey or an online survey. And, uh, and so I, I just wanted to be mindful of that and think about ways that we can help folks engage and give us the same kind of information that we're looking for in the survey, even if we do so in a conversation or with drawings or things like that. Um, so that's, to me, that's the, that's the broader frame is that we want this to, to be a tool that's useful for us and from which we can uh, build out community engagement, public gatherings or phone conversations or in-person visits to classrooms and things like that. Um, revision process. So many of you are probably familiar with working on shared documents where people can come in and do sort of real time or um, asynchronous editing or suggesting and then the, the sort of document or the draft moves along to a place where it's mostly final. Because this is a public and transparent process, that's not something we can or should do. And it means that the significant decisions about what we're doing, our, our process and things like this document need to be made in meetings like this where we are, our deliberation is visible to the public. So, um, I hey Mel. I drafted a survey that has 34 some questions, which is probably too long. Um, and since we're gonna be revising it in real time together, uh, yes. Um, Mel, will you remind me if I don't mention it in the next two minutes to talk about live transcription? Um, so because we're gonna be revising this in real time together with a committee of 18, 19 people, uh, I want us to focus, I want to ask for your comments first in terms of big changes Holy cow, Nathan, you totally didn't address academics. That's a big miss. We need to address that right now. And then we can move into a phase two of wordsmithing. And uh, you know, I think, I think we could write this a little bit better or I don't think this is uh, as engaging as it could be, things like that. So basically bigger, bigger picture questions and bigger picture uh, revisions and edits first, and then we'll get down to the granular stuff. Um, I mentioned in the email that, at least from my experience, I find it easier to respond to and give feedback on a written document that someone else has already drafted. I find it harder to think about that document or whatever instrument it is and think about what's not being asked or what's not included in there that should be in there. And so that's my biggest request of this committee as we go through this process this evening is to think about what questions are we not asking? What areas are we not addressing? Um, so I, I know that that's difficult thinking, but that's my, that's my ask. And then uh, the last thing to think about is in terms of audience for a survey like this, um, both our overall process and the results of this community engagement process need to speak to the vision for the district for pre-K all the way through 12th grade. And that's a big range. Similarly, if we're engaging with younger students, uh, older students, adults in the community, teachers, et cetera, this survey is going to be engaged, going to be filled out by many different people. So I, I started a draft that included sort of a branching survey where if you answer that you're a parent, it takes you to one set of questions. And if you answer that you're a student, it takes you to a different set of questions. And so far I've elected to discard that draft and go with a uniform survey that I think most people can engage with so that we're getting uniform, you know, we're getting not uniform responses, but we're getting responses to a uniform instrument. Uh, I'm happy to debate that, but I want to make that visible. Um, the other piece of this, um, Last meeting when we talked about the scope of inquiry and the categories that, that I had drafted and I'd gotten input from folks in the district, um, some of the comments were, wait a minute, if we, if we define the menu of options, then we're constraining the way that people might think about visioning for the district. And that could, be, that could limit 
the results we get. And I think that that's a really great observation. And um, so within this draft, what I attempted to do was to start with broad open-ended questions. Um, and because of the way surveys work, we can, we can make it so that the person responding to the survey doesn't see the more granular, more specific questions that are later in the survey. At first they do you know, blue sky, big picture thinking where they're generating their own language. And then the second phase of the survey is more granular and specific. Please you know, choose the most important characteristics in this category uh, and things like that. And so my, my strategy was to try to encompass that feedback with early questions that are big and open-ended and then you know, middle stage questions that are middle and late stage questions that are more specific. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do something entirely different where we don't do the really specific pieces. Um, I had another committee member comment one-on-one -on -one via email that they were concerned that if we asked only big broad questions, we would not, um, we might not get the sort of quality and detail responses that we seek. So I think it's a, it's a balance. Um, all right, later on in this meeting, we will talk about distribution strategies. How do we get the survey out there? How do we get feed, feedback and responses? Um, I would love at some point when we talk about distribution strategies to talk about participation goals and just have people name, you know, I hope we get, I hope we get 10 people to respond. I hope we get 100 people to respond, you know, naming participation goals. Um, last meeting, both Mel and I think Sigrid mentioned strategies for alternative engagement with uh, younger folks or neurodivergent folks or others for whom, again, a written survey may not uh, be the best avenue. And I'll ask Mel and or Sigrid to share some ideas that they have during the meeting tonight and anyone else. Uh, it's not just, not just for those folks. And then uh, we, if we have time, we will talk about schedule for community gatherings, how we will manage COVID safety within those gatherings and what roles uh, committee members can take in working with the survey, working with community gatherings, et cetera. Okay, thanks for listening to all that. So uh, I have a draft of the survey open on my, on my machine and I will take notes within that on commentary. Uh, I'm, this is a time when I'm going to probably twice, maybe three times, uh, make sure that we essentially go around in a virtual circle and we hear feedback from anybody, or from everybody. Um, let's see. For lack of, I didn't do a committee a circle order tonight. Hold on. Um, let's go with Tina, Susie, Sigrid, followed by Rhett, Nick, and Merrick. Um, and if let's start with big observations first, and then we'll, we can get another round of granular stuff and I'll keep going down the list, uh, three at a time. Tina, go for it. Um, and Nick, and I, I have to say, I appreciate your apology, but I really want you to give up the document you're working on sooner because I like to read it, sleep on it, come back to it and try it again. So Next time, a day or so. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, big picture. Um, it's too long. <laughs> nobody's nobody's going to survive this, I don't think. And I think there are too many free responses. So I appreciate hearing you say your theory of sky blue and then go to the uh, specifics of it. But... Um, some people, I think, will be taken back by having to start out something and compose it themselves when they're not too sure about what they're thinking. So those are my two biggies. Thank you. Susie? I, I agree with Tina. Um, I felt overwhelmed. My brain, I had to read the first question 
after the um you know self identity part the first question i had to read like three or four times and i was just having a hard time understanding what was going on um i before hearing your explanation i was thinking that i personally my brain would feel better if it was flipped and it was more specifics first and then more open-ended near the end <clears throat> kind of like the way you know tests are set up with like the essay at the end by then your brain's kind of warmed up and not necessarily fed the ideas but your gut it's my brain worked better that way thinking like that so i do think that most people in some way have some kind of neurodivergence and their brain works better in different ways than others so i don't think we can get this perfect for everybody um but i do think it's too long and i felt overwhelmed too um Before we go to Sigrid, I, um, I wanna, speaking of different ways brains function, Mel requested that I turn on a function in Zoom that I didn't know existed called simultaneous transcription. And so on your screens at the lower menu, there should be a CC for closed captioning in the live transcript option. Uh, if you are interested in essentially having this closed captioned instantaneously um, courtesy of Zoom, which is, as I'm observing, not perfect, but decent. Uh, please go ahead and turn that on. And thanks to Mel for raising that as an accessibility point and walking me through how to do it. Okay, Sigrid, go ahead. I also just wanna say real quick that I really appreciate your thoroughness and how long the original draft is. And I think we can go from there, but that was a lot of work and that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say exactly the same. I think I was one of the people at our first meeting that um, wanted to, to hear from people without specific prompts. I don't know if that was in the context of a survey or if it was in the context of just discussion. So whatever context it was, if it was in the context of a survey, I was wrong because, you know, this, I, I agree that, um, uh, that, and I, uh, with um, the first two comments, and I think, you know, just a bigger picture thing to think about is what, what purposes surveys serve, how, how they, you know, how can they, how they can be really good tools and what contexts they can be really good tools in what context they can't. And that, so that is in addition to what the survey looks like, how long and what the questions look like. I think that's a thing for us to, to really think about as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, Rhett, then Nick, then Merrick. Um. It is very long. <clears throat> I'm um, thinking as I speak with people, the conversation is gonna depend on the person, it's gonna depend on my relationship and it's gonna need to have a lot of flexibility. And so I'm hoping that we can essentially sort of zone in, like kind of hone in on some themes that we wanna hope to get at and then maybe expand from there to more specific questions, depending on the conversation and the relationship. And um, I just, and we can send this to a lot of people. It feels like to get good information, I'm gonna to need to talk to people in person. And this is not gonna be the basis of that conversation. Um, and that also applies to the demographic stuff. I don't know. It'd be great. I'm just, I don't know how much flexibility each of us can have um, and how, um, you know, we're all gonna be able to get different information based on the relationships that we have from with people. And I hope that all of that can find its way into this work. Um, I don't wanna exclude anybody because it, I don't want, I don't want a conversation between any of us and another person to sort of, you know, have more or less value 
just because it's the difference between a five minute conversation and a 30 minute conversation. Um, those are some of my thoughts, I guess. I don't... Red, I just want to put a pin in the, the question about flexibility and come back to that. I think it's a good question. Uh, Nick. Yeah, um, just I think some initial thoughts. I thought it was too short. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that uh, one of the things when I was considering this survey and how it, it we're really truly trying to get a great deal of engagement and hear from folks that we ordinarily don't typically hear for is like designing from the margins, right? And so I think about a family that is maybe um, the least likely to do this and how can we make it accessible to them? And if we can make it accessible for them, um, we're going to make it accessible to a more universal group. Um, and so that's something that kept kind of coming up to me, which is maybe that that second tier that you were talking about, Nathan, initially of, of maybe that's just the formatting of the questions and things like that. Um, so I think that's, that's certainly something that I kept thinking about as I read it. Uh, the other piece, um, you know, hearing too many open-ended, not enough open-ended, you know, the opportunity to have a, a, close, a close question uh, followed by an open-ended response, like just having that opportunity for, for many of the questions uh, for those that want to engage in a longer response, but it's not a, the only way to answer this question piece. So uh, yeah, I think those are some of my initial thoughts. Merrick? Alrighty, so I agree with what pretty much everyone's already said about the survey being too long. I'm not totally sure if these questions like are optional or not. And if they were optional, I feel like that might provide a way for people to still answer like the free response questions that they want to yet skip others, which might provide a way for us to still like include those questions. But and at the end of the day, I think we should make this survey like short yet open so, keep, so we can get the most responses possible and like, the most valuable responses. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, next up, Melissa, followed by Libby, followed by Joe. Is Melissa me? I remember there was another Melissa. Uh, Mel Hauser, that's you. Okay, great, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, uh, when, one, of the, one of the many huge challenges with this project is that we have an audience of dysregulated people in a really low bandwidth state. And sometimes when I have conversations with people about big picture stuff, it's almost like when the language is so idealistic and so zoomed out, um, people can't engage with that because they're like treading water and trying to survive. So, um, and that, 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 that really speaks to that, you know, designing, designing from, the, from the margins and like designing from the lowest bandwidth is, is also a, a part of that. So when I think about like how to make the language of this more inclusive, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like when the, the menu options, when there's too many of them, or that the the language that are offered, it almost seems like it's like it's it's like how people think like self care is like what you do when you have time. It's like a lot of the words of like excellence and these you know these really important words, but like you can't. Some people can't. Some brains can't get there because it seems like you know like really. Oops, sorry. Um, it doesn't feel attainable. Like it doesn't feel um or or, or uh tangible maybe what do you wish what do you wish your what do you wish your kid's school experience was like just more kind of everyday language that's my that's my zoomed out approach I could just see you know if I if I gave this survey you know in, in addition to echoing comments from from everyone who's preceded me um, if I if I gave this survey um, to to you know any of the patients I saw today, any of those families, they'd be like, uh, yeah, maybe. Later. I mean, just like it, it, it. 
even me, I would look at this and I would say, oh, I feel shame because I wish that I could engage with this. But I can't. So how to get to the core of what day-to-day life is like for families and students. I think we have to start with that before people can feel safe enough to zoom out at all. Mel, thank you. I want to I want to circle back after we've heard from other folks to talk about the um, your comment about everyday language, um, many other things as well. But that's something sticking with me. Libby, yeah, I, I was going to ditto that, Nathan. You are obviously the husband of a teacher <laughs> in writing this survey. That that comes clear um, through this because you know the language of education, um, the jargony language of education. Um, so I think I, I'd agree with what a lot of people said. I, I just ask us to think about what the purpose of this survey is. Is it a jumping off point? Um, cause if it's a jumping off point, then it should be sort of short and sweet and get, get at some very quick, quick hits that we could elaborate on in conversations, um, later on, because I think that's where we might get, uh, more bang for the open-ended buck. Um, with some of the earlier questions in the survey. So, so my comments would just be, we do need to design it that people are going to answer it. And we want to think about that all of our people are going to answer it. And we want to think about the purpose behind that and, and why we're asking the survey. Cause it, it seemed, it seems like with this initial draft, we're, we're going for the home run. Um, and is that what we need in an initial survey or do we need just a, you know, a bunt to get on base, <laughs> put it that way, to continue the analogy. Uh, Joe Carroll. Libby, thanks for the baseball analogies. Love that. <clears throat> I have just two things, Nathan. The first is that um, in the section 22, the L through R, I feel, I'm just wondering about listing out what appears to be like subject area bands. I was just curious about that I don't know one way or the other but I do think as fun as it might be to get data about like what folks want in terms of subject areas I also worry a little bit about that and think it's too granular for uh, the scope of the survey and then my second thing is just an appreciation I, I also like the free response options underneath very carefully curated choices for the closed questions and I think also because I'm a teacher it actually didn't feel terribly long to me, but I just want to recognize that's probably just because I've had hundreds of surveys come across my path and sort of my career. So it didn't, it just, there's so much on there that we're trying to get at that I, I could understand and forgive the length, but to the extent that concision is possible and redundancies can be eliminated, game on, I think we should do that. Um, so thank you. I appreciate all the work that went into that. Thanks, Joe. Um, just putting a pin in a couple of things, uh, Libby, I do want to return to in the same conversation as everyday language, the jargon question, and then Joe appreciating you calling out the that section 22 subject area bans. Uh, I, I left that in there partly as an exhibit of, okay, everybody watch me go down the rabbit hole. And it's a little bit of a warning, you know, it's already too long. It's a little bit of a warning to all of us that in many of these areas, we can get into the weeds very quickly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm trying to trying to walk that line. Uh, okay, next up uh, for voices, Emery, followed by Elliot, followed by Dottie, after which uh, Kale, Caitlin, and Amira. So Emery, you're up. Uh, I agree with everything that a lot of other people have said about um, making some of the questions optional, just so that way, if people don't want to like go through the entire survey and answer a single question, you can just give their input on the things that are most important to them. Uh, but one other thing I had is for the like more specific closed-ended multiple choice questions. Uh, some of them have like a lot of different entries that you could respond, but it they also label like a cap of 
five uh, that you could select or three that you could select. So um, either kind of taking away that um, limit or else breaking the questions up a little bit more just so that way, like if these things are important to people, they're able to kind of uh, say that without feeling like they're over selecting maybe. I definitely want to come back to that question because that points to a lot of things and we thank you for that. Um, Elliot Muller. Um, I like agree with what everyone said. Um, something that I was just thinking is I think I like I understand wanting to have like more broad questions and then narrowing it in. But as someone who gets like very confused a lot, I um, like I personally feel like if I didn't know what I was supposed to be like talking about and more open questions, I would get overwhelmed and then not I will turn off my Kinder better now. Yes? Okay. Um just like starting with kind of more specifics to know what the survey is more gonna be about. Um just I don't know if that would work for everyone, but like personally get overwhelmed when I don't know what more specifically it's not. I don't know. Thank you, Elliot. I think speaking for myself, I think I got the bulk of your uh, comments. Did anyone else, does anyone else want wish for a recap? Because I want to make sure we hear that everybody heard Elliot. Okay. Elliot, are we coming through clearly to you? Okay, fantastic. Uh, Dottie? Yes, um, one of the things as I read through the survey um, that occurred to me is that I think if we were to put the questions first and put the democrat, uh, I mean demographics at the very end, that more people would answer truthfully and complete it. That's one. Um, and I would like to think also that our product is we want to add, um, you know, what, what people think the end product should be from education, um, because that will tell you a lot about the expectations that children in the schools are experiencing in their homes. And um, we should ask at the end of whatever questions we um, provide in a survey, we should ask, is there anything else you wanted to add? And, um, and, and the end with the Democrat, uh, demographic section. That's all I have to say. And I sort of agree with a lot of the um, ideas that other people have brought up about simplifying the language um, and maybe reducing the range of questions to smaller increments so that people feel like, oh, I can sit down and do this. But if they're going through page after page, some of them are going to stop and just shut it off or they're not going to send it back to you. So that's my comment. <laughs> but I thought, you know, you covered a, a wide range of issues. Dottie, thank you. I especially appreciate the comment about the order of the sections. Uh, I gave a, a decent amount of thought to where to place the demographic questions right. and where to place the, the content questions. And I, I'm, I'm open to either version. To be candid, my placing those things first uh, serve two purposes. One, we really are trying to um, include underrepresented voices. And so that's information I don't want to get. I would prefer not to get 
bunch of survey responses and then nothing or not a lot of information on demographics. So we don't actually know if we're reaching the, the, the groups right. we're wishing to reach. And by putting it up front, I felt like it's a, a version of sort of our own honesty and transparency that we care about this. Um, but I'm certainly open to, to discussing it. Thanks for that. Well, I just don't want, I don't want to discourage people who are not used to doing surveys from, you know, saying, oh, this is going to say too much about me. Um, yeah. And the opinion won't, they won't like my opinion. Right. So I, I, it's just that is the issue for me is that there, you know, I can think of a lot of people who won't complete it if they um, have to go through the identification of themselves first. Good. And there's some, there's some subtle choices we can make in there as well. Okay. Uh, up next, Kale, followed by Caitlin, followed by Amira, and then um, um, Amanda. Um, so I have a few things. Uh, in the beginning, I think Rhett and Sigrid talked about this, about um, is this more of like the, and I think Libby did too, but is this more of the home run or just like the punt? Uh, onto first base and at least from my own perspective this survey does seem like you're just trying to get the get the home run you know get all the information in but I think you get more honest answers in that face-to-face -to -face, like talking with people and I'm wondering if this should be like the the gateway into more of like a per like a, a meetings within the school or whatever um, so something like that. I also wanted to say something about, there was one question, I forget what it was, and th this is very like, um, but it was about age and it said 18 and under. And I felt like if we're talking about schools, the people that we are asking about a lot of like, that are uh, being impacted by these decisions would all fall under there. And I think the difference of a freshman or even like a kid in middle school to a kid who's 17 or 18 looking at college is so different and so uh, vital to the to why we are doing this that I think maybe a little more separation there could be useful. Great observation. This is where this is where I get caught pasting in survey choices I've used in another venue and didn't examine them carefully for, oh, right, we want to be talking to school kids a lot. Thanks, Kale. Caitlin Brower. Okay, I'm so excited to talk. Um, so I definitely agree with a lot of what's been said. I want to definitely build off of what um, Nick and Mel mentioned, and I think Libby. Um, I love what Nick said about building from the margins. I think that's very, poignant. I, I love that term. And I think we should definitely think about that as we're doing this survey. Um, I also was just thinking about like the name of what we are and we are a visioning committee. So then I was thinking a vision board and that sort of feels like, it does feel like the bigger picture. Um, like what are your hopes and dreams for either yourself and your education or your kids self or your kids education. Um, and then just coming from a place of like, what do you need for support? Like what specifically does your family, what would it look like if you had the, the best support that you could have? Um, so I guess, yeah, just building off of, I think what all of you are saying about like, this is getting to the nitty gritty before we're ready for it. So for now, that's it. Thank you, Caitlin. Amira? Okay, so a few things. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think of it before, but Kale brought up a really good point about like the age groups and like being 18 under. And if we're really trying to focus on the demographics, I feel like that should be something we should focus on too, because the students are a really big part of it and they definitely have very different mindsets. So fo focusing more in on that 
could be very helpful. Um, that also kind of leads me into my next thing of uh, like making the language of like the way the questions are phrased like more um, like everyday terms because also if we're trying to reach more students younger the younger the students go the harder it may be for them to understand the questions they're really asking um so i feel like even as like me being in in like one of the older grades i even had to like reread some of the questions and like really try to understand what i was trying I was being asked and what my answer would be for those questions so i feel like it's really easy to get lost in them um not only that, it's so long and there's so much to take in on so many different aspects that I feel we shorten it or even just like something as little, I guess it's not really little, but it's a kind of a bigger thing is just like fixing the way those questions are phrased can really help get better responses. Um, I also kind of agree with everyone else about um, like these questions are a lot of questions I feel like we'd, we'd get answers actually having a conversation with people about them because sometimes it's hard to really type out what you're trying to say and what your words are actually trying to mean. So that was just a few of my experience. Thank you so much. And I, um, Amira is not the only one who's mentioned this, but the idea of, of using direct conversations as a, as a major tool of ours, which is definitely part of the plan. And I think that we should talk tonight, if possible, if we have the time, about how we imagine this process uh, going forward. Uh, Amanda. Thanks, uh, everybody. And nice to meet you. I'm sorry I, I couldn't be here last time. Mondays are really hard for me, um, but I am here today. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a little long. I think the description of the um, demographics could have a better explanation of why we're collecting demographics. Um, and, and that could be optional, but just being able to explain why is really important for people. Um, and, and then I, I, I see some more of this vision as, as I feel like there was missing a little bit of, of the adult portrayed question around like what knowledge and skills um, perhaps adults need to have in order to support students. Um, and I think like thinking of the uh, excellence in education as like what do we want our that students to graduate with could solve some of those questions and like having this vision and be like, was the graduate portrayed? Was the adult portrayed? And what are the systems shifts that we need to have, which will include some of that infrastructure piece of it. Um, just like thinking vision, right? Like the big thing for me was, that was what uh, came into my attention. And so I think everybody else, yeah. Okay, I just, can you repeat what you were, so I got, I was following you through um, a better picture of, of the adults and the knowledge and skills that adults need to support students. And then can you repeat what you said next, please? Um, just, just what are the shifts? What, what are the system shifts that we need to have in order to be able to do that? So that will go into some of the questions that you have around uh, either values. So one example could be, you know, like if people were, this is just an example, if people were to think that we're a punitive school versus becoming a restorative school, you know, like things like that, that these are all jargon, but things that can then be condensed into the uh, our common language, but um, so being able to think in that in that sense for me, as my brain thinks, it's what is helpful. Um, but I do agree that too many open-ended questions without much context, it kind of it can be 
it can delay some of the work that we want to do. And I really love the values. I, I think values is really important when it comes to vision. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous about this next stage because it risks me trying to respond to all these comments and me being the only speaker. <laughs> um, I'm gonna do a little bit of that, but I wanna call out some questions that I wrote in my margins um, based on some of this feedback. One that Amanda just pointed out and that came up earlier, uh, Libby called it out as jargon and somebody else called it out as you know sort of everyday language. One of the questions I was asking myself as I drafted this was, do we need to, do we wish to at any point, whether it's in the survey or somewhere else, provide definitions to folks we're talking with? For example, uh, social, social and emotional learning is, a, is a, a, a piece of the education, uh, explicit education that is addressed in Montpelier Roxbury schools now that idea of explicit education around social and emotional learning is not something that I had when I was a kid in school. And so I'm assuming that therefore it's a new concept to many people my age, uh, especially those who don't, aren't married to a teacher. Um, uh, Amanda just raised the point arguably again, when she called out you know, the difference between a punitive school and a restorative school um, and both of those things probably would require a little bit of explanation for some folks. We don't need to answer that right now, but I just want, I want to make sure that um, the questions that are being asked are in everybody's head as we consider how we adjust this. Um, I want to talk about how we imagine this process, and I, I'm going to stick with Libby's home run versus uh, base hit or bunt, because uh, I did, I did write this survey as, as the home run, right? If, if, if I had my way in, in my perfect world, everybody in the district, every, every taxpayer, every kid, every adult would fill this out completely and give us all the information. And we'd have just such rich responses. It'd be really meaningful to the board and, and the public could also see it. Um, it can be many things. This could be this, this version or even our edited version could never see the light of day and we could choose to, to do smaller segments. Um, we could use this as, a, as an outline for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, there are a lot of ways that this can happen you know, and, and can be moderated. Um, I get a little bit stuck between a love of numbers and quantity of data, so quantity of respondents if you know if we had if we had 500 people respond to this i'd be over the moon because we would have a ton of information we would be able to answer you know if somebody said well what did the what did high school age kids say we could answer that question because we might have enough data points to do it um, so i i get excited about that on the other hand the in-depth conversations when somebody you know you have the ability to say to a neighbor you're talking with well, you know, when you say, um, when you say, I want my student to feel like they belong at school, what do you mean by that? And can you, can you talk about that some more? And so that depth of conversation and relationship building, I think is really valuable. Uh, it can be then a little bit difficult to take the information we get from those conversations and sort it into some sort of uniform um, information that we can share and use as we then ultimately say to the school board, here's what your community vision, here's what the community cares most about in their vision. Not saying that we don't do that, I'm just pointing out that, that these, are, these are complicated. Um, it is too long. There's no question about it. Uh, oh, so, so back to the model of how we think this might happen. If we don't go for the home run, and if we do a launch of a base hit, and we just try to get people engaged in this process, 
the implication is that they will that we'll then re-engage them and we'll either ask them more questions more deeply or we'll follow up with a call or there are other or they will attend a public gathering and we can get more information that way um i hope that is true it may be true that we get a lot of responses to a short survey and then we get fewer re responses to phone calls and conversations and then fewer people who show up at a community gathering so that so my fear is that if we don't go for a version of the home run we miss out because everybody's just gathered on first base and we never learn about whatever we would have learned at third base um, again that's not killing that killing that observation just pointing out why I find it to be in tension with some of the things that I want out of this process. Um, since it is too long, I think we can all agree on that, except for uh, Joe, Joe and I. Joe and I love how long this is. Um, uh, you know, then the question is, what do we cut? And it, so I guess I, I should be doing a dance here because I don't think I heard anybody say, Nathan, you really missed this major area. We didn't ask about this area. So maybe Mel's picking up her phone. <laughs> Go ahead, Mel. <laughs> I would not say that my brain was able to even identify gaps because of the, of, of the zoomed outedness. Okay. It, it, um, so and, and I don't know if other if other people had that experience, but it almost seemed like it was a it was a survey about philosophy, which I could talk about all day. I love that stuff when I have bandwidth. Um, but in terms of concrete information that we want from the people, I wasn't even like I, I, I wasn't even, I forgot that was my job to think about because it was a totally different survey. If that makes sense. It does to some extent. I think that the I want to uh, I want to come back to the your comment about concrete information from people, um, and your comment about philosophy. So, because this process is theoretically about shared vision for the district, and then ideally also about values that are shared, and and that both of those things will support the board as they do planning and decision making and then cascade down to support the administration and the education professionals. I think this is pretty blue sky. And I, you know, the um, Joe pointed out um, under section 22 L through R where I talk about, you know, science, technology, uh, math, and uh, arts and history and literature. I left that in there as, a, um, as an example of what I would call more concrete. And I think that I left it in there partly as a caution because they, as I mentioned the first meeting, one of the things we need to be careful about is we are listening for what's the vision around the district and if the vision is um, for graduates to be prepared to be global citizens, for example, we may want to make that a little bit more specific, but once we hand it off to the board and the board chews on it and they hand it off to the administration, whether we offer visual arts or history or Latin is a decision that's largely made by the administration and so that's why, and I'm not, I'm not trying to um, dismiss your comment, Mel, but I, I just want to, I'm going to keep calling out that, that balance that we're striking. Um, I see Sigrid and I see Tina. Give me, can you guys hold those thoughts for half a second more? Okay. Um, just the... Uh, Nick's comment about designing from the margins and the comments that again about sort of everyday language. Um, I'm inclined to very strongly agree with you and, and make it much more straightforward and accessible. I really like the way you presented that Nick in terms of if this is uh, 
if this is easy for the folks who are least likely to engage with it, then it will be easy for everyone. Um, and then if there's a, if there's loss in that kind of simplification of language, then we need to figure out a way to deal with that. Um, I see Sigrid, then Tina, then Amanda, um, and it is 7.30. Sigrid, go. I think uh, if, if we can um, get a little bit more clarity or specifics around, or even maybe some examples around how the board will use this vision, that might help. So, so a vision can be a lot of things. A vision can be a vision statement that's a couple of sentences long, or it can be, you know, it, it can be different things. It, it, this, this vision and what we've, what we've seen so far includes, you know, a lot of stuff, including stuff around facilities. You know, the, the, the project that I worked on that was a statewide vision for Vermont students was only about the students. This is what we want students to, you know, to, um, for our graduates to sort of have these characteristics. That's very different than a, a bigger, bigger vision that also includes facilities, that also includes, you know, this other stuff. So, you know, my comment at the first meeting about the time frame, um, I guess that's e that's even more relevant around this be because, you know, what when we're talking about vision, what are we talking about? Are we talking about what are we talking about students? Our vision for students, what our students look like when they graduate from from Montpelier High School. Are we talking, are we, you know, if it is this bigger vision that includes everything, that includes facilities, includes what we want our educators to look like or, da -da -da, you know, all this stuff, that's a different, that's a different ball game, you, you know, coming back to that, that analogy. And, and it's just different. And it's going to take a different, different way of thinking, which is fine. But, you know, um, so I think clarity around that for us might be helpful in, in, in thinking, you know, because we have to know what, you have to know what the end goal is. What are we trying to produce? And I think we're not clear about that right now. So once we know what we're trying to produce, that will help the board. And I think also obviously be a benefit to the community because the community will be able to see that vision. Um, then we can really start working backwards from that and what needs to happen to, to get the right questions to ask, the right processes and, and the right groups, you know, how, how we're gonna do that. I will circle back to some of that, but I wanted to hear from Tina and then Amanda. Well, to expand on that, I guess I'd say, Nathan, the reason you haven't heard from anybody about what you left out was because you didn't leave out a thing. And you cannot ask people about all of these questions. You have to say to yourself, what's the most important thing? And that's part of what Sigrid is saying. Let's figure out what is it we really want to know and condense those into a few questions. That's number one. Number two is you don't need a glossary. As hard as this is, you need to explain each of these things you're asking so that no glossary is needed. So if um, the word sounds too educational jargony, then we have to find the word that doesn't require an explanation. It's just that somebody will understand it and no glossary is next, ne necessary. Those are my two. Uh, Amira, I see you after Amanda. Uh, and Tina, thank you. <laughs> that this survey is one of the all the instruments. And so that you wanna have people that will use this, but not necessarily all the people are gonna fill out this survey, right? So I think designing a survey 
uh, we will also still have the opportunities to have those focus groups, those small visits, those one-on-ones if we want to. So I think that it's not, the survey is not the end goal. Um, and I just wanted to share, I think one of the things that we can think about how to do this, but I just had my son is uh, neurology appointments in Boston Medical, Boston Children's Hospital. And they sent me this huge survey. Um, but one of the questions that I was very impressed with was how did I learn as a parent? How would they give me this information that they wanted to give me? Uh, and so they had, and I took a picture, like observation, listening, one-on-one, video, illustration, diagram, receive information at, at more than one thing, reading materials, hands-on, group, demonstration, uh, verbal, and other. And that was so helpful for me. And then the doctors took that and like were able to do all the things that I needed to be able to understand what is happening with my son. So I think when I was thinking of this survey, I was thinking, and, and the question that you were asked Nathan at the beginning, I was like, yeah, we need to, and I don't know how that looks like. Is it pre-survey where like, hey, we're about to do a community survey. Tell us how you learn and, and tell us how you like to engage in this piece um, that could lead to some of this that we need to, you know, like to support. So those were my big things to add. I love it. And I, I desperately would like you to send me that photograph of the, uh, of the, you know, how do, how do you best engage? How do you best learn? Thank you. Uh, I see Amira, then Mel, and then Susie. Go ahead. Amira. Um, I, would, I agree with like Sigrid. I feel like the, um, way that the survey is now, it's almost like our eyes are bigger than our stomachs as kind of like a thing where we just want to get to the point and we want to, you know, have everything all in place. But I feel like for somebody, it could be very overwhelming and unsure of what we're actually trying to steps for people um so I feel like that could be a little trouble did ask people all of these questions but we kind of broke it up to a stage where it wasn't so overwhelming and consuming to them um as well as maybe like the option to also have an open conversation with it. like not just the survey as our one mode of communication with them uh, Amira, thank you. I got, I think, most of that. I'm just going to read what I wrote and please fill in where I missed because I, uh, to me, the, your sound was breaking up. Um, our eyes are bigger than our stomachs, which I love. Um, it, we want, it seems like we want to have everything in one place, but it might be overwhelming um, and it might not be clear the core thing that we're asking. And then you think it would be better if we broke it into stages or into sizes that are not so overwhelming. Is that what I heard accurately? Amira, did I do justice to what you said? Okay, I see you in the text saying yes. Thank you very much. Um, Next up, I have Mel and then Susie. Amanda, is that a new hand or the, uh, the same hand? Okay, you're good. Uh, Mel, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so so I I find myself wondering, is it an it do is there an option to rather than think about, or in addition to thinking about, you know, first pass, second pass, you know, catching people in the different phases, could we? offer multiple ways of giving input all at once. So you have the person and you say, we have an opportunity here to seek community input about what we want school to look like. Um, we offer, 
you know, uh, and you list the five ways that you can participate as a community member, you know, your survey, your phone call, your focus group, your text box, your live instant messaging, like whatever it is, your art, you know, we have these seven ways you can participate. Let us know which one you want to do. Because my concern, and this was my experience um, with the first round of ESSER 3 community um, uh, engagement was that it's like when you have the experience of saying like, ah, this, it's not for me. You don't get me again for this subsequent thing because I've already decided that this is not for me. I mean, I like made myself do it, but like, you know, like it, it was, it was hard because the, the very first thing was like a lot of content heavy, like, you know, just, just um, a lot of stuff that didn't work for my brain. Um, and it was like by, you know, like, thank goodness, the next one was a focus group because I could, you know, I could do that one. But initially it was like, well, this project, I don't think I can touch this project. And I'm concerned that that's the experience of a lot of people that I know in the community. Thank you. I just want to note, I think I see in, in order, Caitlin, then Libby, then Dottie. Is that accurate? Okay, great. Oh, and Susie, sorry, Susie's first. Um, Mel, just because I'm not responding right away doesn't mean I have not heard you. Susie, go ahead. Um, I sort of think like a layered approach is a good idea and like a, like a pre-survey uh, like advertisement of who we are and what we're doing so that people can like have a minute to process even how they can participate in it. Like I know for me, of course, I think about what I want for my children and what is best for them and what is best for my community. But like, could I just like, talk about it right now and write everything down right now and know all the words right now maybe not and I think a lot of people maybe their brains just aren't like warmed up for that yet so and like how Mel said to give people options of like these are the things we're going to be doing so that people feel like they can be ready to participate and that sort of idea of like sleeping on it and coming up with really oh what actually what really is important to me because not everybody knows that just you know like that so I think maybe doing a pre, you know, survey advertisement of who we are and what we're doing. Cause I'm sure most people don't even know that this committee exists at this point. And so if you just get some email coming in saying, oh, this is this new committee, you know, people might not be actually ready to engage in that. Um. Susie, thank you. I just want to pause and uh, thank Merrick, uh, Joe and Merrick. I see your hands. I've got you on my list. Um, I want to point out that we've heard in this sort of second popcorn round, we've heard from Amira and we've heard from Merrick, or we're about to hear from Merrick, but it's been a decent amount of adult voices, and I'm watching that. Uh, Libby. Um, I would just offer out uh, the the thought exchange as a first go um, because you can put survey questions in around demographics and you can also put survey questions in around how would you like to engage further. Um, I think it can hit a lot of things and then your thought exchange question can be what's the thing you value most about your about your education or your child's education and then from there the team can take the themes you know, and synthesize the themes that come out of that pretty easily so that we can create questions in whatever round two might be. So I was just, I was just thinking that we may get more bang for our buck for, from a broad thought exchange that also asks very specific survey questions that's getting at what some people are saying here. Um, and then um, using that information to drive the next steps. And it's just a thought um, because it's my new favorite tool, tool as those close to the school district really know. Um, but we do have that at our beck and call and it might give us, it might, it might be a better, a, a different jumping off point than a, than a straightforward survey. Thank you for that. Um, just, uh, Kaylin, you're up and then Dottie, then Joe, then Merrick and then Kale. Is that right, Kale? Yes. So um, um, go ahead, Kaylee. Yeah, I think what Susie was saying, I think Susie just made a really good point um, that a lot of people don't even know that we exist and um, would love to know that we exist. So I do feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm just worried about, I don't, 
I, I'm worried that we're spending all of this time on specifics with this survey before people even know that we're here. And that, I mean, Sigrid's still wanting clarification on exactly what our goal is. And I think probably a lot of us are. So um, I guess I'm just worried about the order in which we're doing things a little bit. Caitlin, thank you. I'm gonna, I wanna pause. Um, I, it's good that you brought us back to Sigrid's um, comment about clarifying the goal. And one of the ways that I prepared myself for this, um, even before proposing to the, to the district that I do this work, and, and then as I've designed this, is to look at models of other, you know, vision statements from other districts, um, you know, where I could find it, other models of, of community engagement around this, you know, values or, or vision. And what I will try to do within the next few days is gather a bunch of links to some of the ones that I found excellent and some of the ones that I found awful <laughs> and, and a few in between. Um, and I also want to circle back if we have time tonight and hear from the two board members who are on the call, Rhett and Amanda, um, to see what their response is to how might the board use this, the information that we produce. Because I think those are, um, you know, first from Sigrid and then from Caitlin, those are really good observations. Uh, okay, sorry for that pause. Um, Dottie, then Joe, then Merrick, then Kale. And we have 15 minutes left, which means we are going to not get to some other things, but that's, this is being a really fruitful conversation. Go, Joe. Okay, well, I have been listening to people trying to simplify and use words that everybody can understand. And one of the things that occurs to me is, um, what if we created a visual, like a pie with pie slices and just wrote single words or um, a topic on each one of them? And as we met with a person, I think the people who said we need to communicate verbally would have an edge and say, we'd like to talk to you about these, any of these that interest you. So that's my you know, idea of getting the conversation off the ground is having you know, some large visual with the topics we want to discover um, who is interested or how many people are interested in those topics as the first stage. And then we could elaborate in another um, level later on. Daddy, thank you. Joe, you're up. Two quick things. Um, the first is I, I can't believe I'm gonna be defending educational jargon. I mean, I'm just surprised as I say that out loud, but. Just as a teacher, the, those jargony terms team, they exist to create space for teachers to emphasize things that were undervalued. So social emotional learning, I agree, it's kind of like a jargony term, but now we have space as teachers to really uh, delineate the specific ways we care about students' mental health, to, to use one example. So I think there's a balance there. To the extent that we can make it less jargony, I'm on board, I can be super helpful with that, but also know that like by, by getting rid of a term, maybe we're kind of like, pushing something out that was hard fought to get in. And the second thing is, I think it'd be cool to have students and teachers provide like vision statements of their own as like exemplars or templates for people to see, because I think it could be useful if you're filling out a survey and they say vision. And then it's sort of like, here are five students and their vision for excellence in education, or here are five teachers and their vision. Just throwing those two ideas out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Merrick and Kale, hang on one second. Um, a thing that I meant to say earlier that I find really interesting about this kind of process uh, is that while we are designing a process to engage with the public and listen and take in information, it is not a one-way street in that there is an education component to what we're doing. Every time one of us gets into a conversation with someone else, anytime we put out a survey, we are both telegraphing sort of the values that are implicit in how we designed the survey, which is exactly what we're discussing right now, and I love it, 
Um, we are also, you know, in the case of social emotional learning, we may be introducing or um, uh, elaborating on a concept that is new or relatively new to somebody on the other side of the conversation. And then um, just to quickly address the point about do people know that we exist as in the visioning committee? I, the first answer is no, not very much. And so far I have not been pushing that because in this again, may be a personality component or flaw. Uh, I want us to be sort of ready to with our process before we announce to the world, like, hey, we're here, we're gathering this information, we really want your input. Um, because I, to me, there is a, there's a lot of value to, to some order and organization and process. Um, happy to take, I mean, I'm hearing some um, maybe tension or concerns around that approach. So I'm, I'm happy to hear more of those. All right, I'm gonna be quiet now. Merrick, you're up and then Kayla, you're next. Thank you very much. Alrighty, well, first, I really agree with what Mel and others have said, and I think that we should employ and give people many different op op like options to contribute to this visioning process. Um, I also want to build off Susie. I think we should make it a priority to advertise our intentions throughout our community. And while you just said that uh, we should have like a clear focus first, I think that focus will develop with uh, community like input. And I think we should specifically focus this input in our schools, since this is like where we are trying to impact and change things. And I think that each student member could help, uh, could certainly help spread the word in this regard. Uh, that's all. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Kale, go ahead. I had the same idea. Um, I, we keep talking about our goals and the gist that I always got from the beginning of all of this was our goals would be, um, you know, come to us once we learned what the community wanted. And maybe that's not what this is about, but that, that's kind of what I got. Um, but I also agreed with both Merrick and Joe about the whole idea that like seeing an example of something is so useful in, in, in any facet of, of, out, even outside of education, but I think seeing an example and being able to work from that is so needed, especially with something that's so like open-ended. Um, so I agree with that. But then my final thing was, I learned about this because a teacher told me, but I don't really know how was this brought up. I heard it was like on front porch form or something else. Like how was this brought up to other people? And are those means of being brought up on front porch forum or I don't know, talks with like um, adults, is that the way that we wanna uh, send this survey out or our message out? And maybe that's another thing we should think about is how and where do we you know, spread the word? Gail, thank you. The um, you point to the one of the things on that we're probably not going to get to tonight is the distribu distribution strategies, or in more everyday language, how do, how are we going to get this out? Uh, and I I hope that they are multi-channel and that we each use as many tools as we have at our disposal to address that. So I appreciate that comment. I want to um, um, We're, Were you going to ask board members what their thought was? I, I will in just a second, and because it's it's a segue from this comment. We're hearing, <clears throat> you know, it's not clear what our, it's not clear to some of us how the board might use this or how the district might use this. Uh, therefore, it's hard to know how to design it. And then I just heard uh, Kale say, I thought that our goals and the and you know would come to us once we have community input, and I, I just want to point out all those things are true and relevant. Our role is to make some initial decisions about what we're asking. So that was at the last meeting when I introduced the idea of the scope of inquiry. That was me saying, um, "Here are the areas I think we need to explore." 
And facilities is one of those, right? We can make this a lot shorter by cutting the facilities questions. Um, that would ignore the fact that there's a community discussion happening about what's the, what's the role for Roxbury Village School, for example. So if the district is okay to do without that information, we can not include a whole section of this survey. But that's an example, right? So the way I said, this is a two-way street, what we, how we design this process and how we design these questions, what we're asking telegraphs to the people on the receiving end or giving us input, what we're thinking about and what we're asking about. And so we, we have to make some, dis, some decisions about what we care to ask about and what's, what are the highest priorities. That's our job. Um, we don't have, as Sigurd will happily point out, we don't have enough time for this to be a more iterative process where we do you know, sort of a number of stages and we take a lot of time. Um, it has, it, it, by the effect of the, of the sort of this project and this contract, it has to be somewhat compressed. So that's also partly, for example, that's, that's a reason that you are seeing a survey that I drafted and we're all responding to it as opposed to the process being a little bit more organic to, to generate that uh, altogether. That's an attempt on my part to compress the, the sort of design the instrument process to make that quicker. Okay, uh, I see you Sigurd, but I might ask you to hold. Um, I do wanna hear Rhett and Amanda respond to the question of how do you imagine that the board will use this information? And then I wanna reserve a few minutes for a reflection on sort of how this is all going. How did this meeting go? Are there things you wish to be better aside from Tina wishing me to get materials to you sooner? Um, Amanda or Rhett, please respond. Do you mind if I go ahead? Um, well, if there are gonna be changes to what is offered, what is offered from the schools or to staffing, I think we want to know um, what direction does the community want us to go in. Um, so that's uh, so, um, that's basically what I think the values of the community are going to help us put resources in one place and not in another place, um, essentially. <clears throat> um, going back to how this happens. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, if we're asking for something from people who don't have a lot of bandwidth, I think it's important that we offer something also like, how are things going for you? And just give people a chance to vent because as a representative of this committee, the district, you know, uh, I want to, I want to offer some kind of support, even if it's just in people's ability to vent. Um, and I hope that everyone that, that through that process, we can gather information. And then we worry about a lot of this really sort of detailed survey stuff sort of after the fact, I think if we can give somebody a good interaction with one of us, it's going to encourage them to go further, further with, you know, more detailed, whether it's through the thought exchange, which is a great tool for some people or a survey or a, a, a drawing or a video or any way that we can come up with people having an opportunity to share with us. I think the first thing we need to do is say, we care about you. How are you doing? Um, and, and then we worry about all these details kind of after the fact is sort of how I'm thinking about this. I can add a little bit. I think, um, you know, the school board sets the vision for the district long term. So right now we need those tools. I know that the administration kind of has a process. And right now the board is in the process of creating that. So um, a lot has happened in the last couple of years. We had um, the school vision committee, which gave a lot of feedback about a set of questions around how the community was moving. A lot of changes were made out based on that. Um, that kind of trickled down to what the budget reflected this year. Uh, there's an SR3 funding that is coming in line. We had a series of focus group asking people um, what they were thinking about that trickles down in, and, and I know that Mel 
put this on, on the budget. And all of those are interrelational. But at the end of the day, it is the school board that makes decisions in two areas. One is policy and one, and one is the budget decision. So right now we don't have the, an actual tool to say this is what the community wants outside of what has happened in, from I've been here two years. So for these past two years, maybe before, but it's really not informing the way that we make decisions. And I think this visioning process is gonna help us move that process further. I know that there's a lot that believe that we need, we, our role is the community input, right? Like we are the bridge between what the administration is doing and what the community is feeling. And, and we are kind of look at that working with Libby um, around how that happens. And also this vision process can create a model of accountability to, to say, okay, this is what is needed from the community. This is what is needed. Where do we see that? And that, that we can project back to you and to the community that's asking the question and say, you know, you're taken care of and these are the ways that you are being taken care of. This is the way that we're moving that vision process. So this is a really important part because this is creating a long-term vision of where we wanna be. And I know this process maybe was done before and it has been done because we change administrations, we change a school board, but this is an attempt to not have this being disjointed, but really that we can work with Libby to make that practice really uh, rooted into the community needs. And I don't know if Libby would like to add something to that. No, I think you nailed it, Amanda, right there. It's, it's you know, you have change in administration and you have uh, change in pieces. I know, I know just based on my experience from the last four years that when you get granular, you'll have a group of people saying you should do nothing but outdoor education. That's what this community values. And you'll have another group that says you should do nothing but restorative practices and trauma-based informed instruction. And that's what this community values. And you get another group that says, you need to get my kid prepared for Harvard and that's it. And you have another group that says mental health, like the, the difference in, in value is pretty big. So um, when you get granular. Um, so I guess my hope would be what's the broad umbrella um, to guide both the school board and the direction that the school board provides the administration in making decisions for our kids, they're our most prized commodity. So, um, so yeah, I think when, when we first started talking about this visioning piece, um, it's, it's, it's really getting those broad generalized values for the community. So it's not me making it up as I go or, um, or the board making it up as they go, but we have something to base off of. And I think Nathan, to your point earlier about infrastructure, it's a really good example, right? Um, is that once those broad generalized values are named, then when questions come up about school buildings and use of school buildings, because it's not just Roxbury, it's Main Street Middle School as well. Um, it's, it's lots of, <laughs> I mean, I hear lots of things about our buildings and very old buildings. And uh, so it's, it's here are our values, here's the education we want for our kids. Can we accomplish that in the buildings that we have? You know, that's the question for the, for the board to really tackle with the community. Um, but we can't answer that question until we have values stated. Um, Mel, I see your hand. Um, Sigrid, I appreciate you putting what you just put in the chat and I'll read it in a second. Kale, is that an old hand or a, a, a new hand? Old hand, old hand. Okay. Um, Mel, I don't, I'm not trying to run you over here. The, Sigrid, your point about the time frame for this process is great. Um, I will say that I am open to changing the time frame, um, and I will touch base with the board offline, not entirely offline, but offline about that. Um, so if we stick with the existing timeline, my response is we're going to do the best we can, and we're going to work really hard at this. If we extend the timeline, there are benefits to that. There are some losses probably in the sense that do we have the board's attention when they have the capacity to receive the information and act on it? Um, that's one of the risks. Um, Mel, go ahead and then we need to close this. I figured out what my deal was with the zoomed out. It's that some brains can't think in 
philosophical categories. I think it's an executive functioning difference. The the that 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 like going from zoom in to zoom out, only some brains do that. And so you know, with 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 uh, I run a nonprofit. So of course we start with value statement, vision, mission, all the things. That was really hard for some people. And now I'm connecting those dots. I think that's what's going to be hard to engage people in a survey like this, as opposed to like more of a needs assessment model, which I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we change the scope of a vision statement. I'm just saying like it, some brains are able to, when you, when you, like, if you ask somebody, um, what's going well about school? Well, you are capturing their values because they wouldn't have said something was going well unless they valued it. Um, and when you ask someone what they wish were different, they come up with really interesting things because that's also telling you information about their values, which inform a vision. Um, but it's, it's not using the vision type words that some brains use through that lens and some brains don't. That's a great point. I think, again, we, this is one tool and it's, and we can use multiple tools and we can be good listeners and bring that information back to this group. Um, I am caught between wishing to observe the sort of advertised timing of this and whatever needs are pulling at you all. I think I just saw an interloper in the background of Caitlin's screen. And, um, uh, I would like to spend a couple minutes, if people have time, any reflections you have on how this conversation went this evening, on how this process is going for you all, and anything you'd like to see better or differently, you're also welcome to send that to me in writing or call me. But I looked like, I see Kale's hand, I thought Caitlin was maybe going to say something. Go for it. Kale, you're up. And then- One little, little thing is, is there a, we haven't talked about later dates for things. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but, or also venue in which these are being held. I didn't know if that is something that is on your mind. Probably is. That's all. Okay. Yes, it is. We didn't get to it tonight. And uh, it's a, my, my first approach is let's try to use the school facilities because we want to put the schools at the center of this discussion, but we can expand on that. Go Merrick. All right, so I know this has kind of been like the point of the last two meetings, but as you stated, like we only have a limited number of meetings in general. So I was just thinking that it's probably important that we really focus on, you know, getting to work on defining what our goals are and like starting at least some options in regards to either surveys or other, other things that we're talking about. Like really just uh, starting something, I would say. Thank you. Tina? I, I actually think that you need to try to stick to the timeline because the school board needs this information in order to proceed on. And so if you're gonna stick to the timeline, Joe, the old teacher in me says, give us some homework. So you can't quite accomplish everything with this number of people here. So maybe it's figure out a way that we need to respond in between to quicken the process that has been on my mind and i'd like that suggestion uh, especially the homework one um amanda i will just add that if, if the board can have at least something you know by the time we're supposed to be done the work can continue like i said i, I think we see this as an ongoing process uh, that, you know, we can think about, you know, other things later, but that we can try to stick with something so that the board has something to work with, because we do need to do our work plan too for the next year. Um, like we need some of this information. So I think extending things sometimes, you know, then it just will have sometimes best results, sometimes the same result. Uh, so at least to try to get there and, and we can evaluate next month or so and see where we're going. And, you know, there's always flexibility. It's, it's not tight, but we do, like Tina says, it's, it's important to have something that we can work with. Thank you very much. Joe, I see your hand. I want to give this about five more minutes and then I, I, we need to stop. 
Go ahead, Joe. Wanted to appreciate a process point, Nathan. In the beginning, you picked an order and we got to hear from everybody at least once. I think that's super helpful to open a meeting. So thank you. Any other thoughts on how this is going? Amira? I thought we all did a really good job of like putting in our own terms and like of ideas, even if we didn't reach our agenda. I feel like we did a really good job of getting some the ground points and like clarifying questions. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't see other hands, so I'm going to adjourn this meeting and I will send, um, because of our open meeting process, this is a little bit tricky. Um, I did do some homework uh, to individual people in the entering, intervening time between last meeting and this meeting, and I'll do more of that now. Uh, we are really gonna need to resolve on some of these devices by the end of our next meeting so that we can get off the ground. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled with the contributions we, we've had. Uh, it's given me a ton to think about and please contact me in any way if you have other thoughts or other nudges. Thanks again.